Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a little poem to think of time. We have nine sections of the poem, but it's not very long. It is in some ways what you might think of as the last of the autumn rivulet collection or cluster, although technically it's not. But some scholars have kind of seen it that way. Um, this is, some consider this one of the most impressive of Walt Whitman's um, early poems that will end up here in Leaves of Grass. All of our big five, epistemology, ontology, psychology, sociology, and of course the question of theodicy, will all end up here. Now our assumptions that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net, down that left-hand side, talks with Walt, our playlist, everything from inscriptions and, and, and all to follow up through, and we just finished with transpositions. Now, our Nortons will give us a, uh, some important background information for this poem. This was the third of the untitled 12 of the first edition of Leaves of Grass, 1855. The poem was named Burial Poem in 1856, Burial in 1860 and 67, and To Think of Time Since 1871. Like, Norton says, The Sleepers, it's been considerably revised, although unchanged in essentials, and a comparison of the various editions is interesting. As the earlier titles suggest, this poem poses the question of death, which absorbs such 19th century poets as Poe, Tennyson, Bryant, Wordsworth, Dickinson. Wordsworth, or, or Whitman's poem, less complex than his other great poem dealing with time and death, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, is nonetheless powerful in its blunt immediacy. It's unevasive confrontation of the reader with the temporality of possessions and materials and with the iconic fact of transience within seeming permanence is remindful of Emerson's Hamartia. The black lines of burial creep over the whole earth, yet the poet's affirmation is unequivocal. The goal of good is unmistakable. Nothing dies. Everything has a soul, and the poet does not walk towards annihilation. The exquisite scheme is for immortality. Now, we're going to enjoy uh, this poem. I wish I could read it in its entirety because it does read so brilliantly, but unfortunately I can't. Hey, uh, this to think, you'll remember this from starting from Pominock, um, none has begun to think, or from to a stranger, I um, am to think of you. Seventeen times in this poem, to think will actually happen. By the way, the word time has been used up to this moment in time, no pun intended, 129 times. So Whitman is clearly interested in the use of this word time, and we'll see it all the way through the poem, starting in passage number one. To think of time, of all that retrospection. And again, this word retrospection only, only will uh, get will get used one more time in mediums in Starry Night, a, pa a collection of poems that will come. But think about how retrospection has been really the project of Leaves of Grass from the beginning. To think of today and the ages continued henceforth. In other words, we're going to be thinking now about the past, the present, and of course the future. We're going to get three of these have yous. We're going to get five rhetorical questions. Have you guessed you yourself would not continue? Have you dreaded these Earth beetles, go back to this compost for that, that's, uh, that idea. Have you feared the future would be nothing to you? Is today nothing? Is the beginningless, beginninglessness um, uh, past nothing? If the future is nothing, they are just as surely nothing. In other words, you cannot believe that your life has value if you also believe that there is nothing to all of this. And this is, again, Whitman's informed idealism, as we've referenced it before. Notice, guessed, uh, we think of curious in Leaves of Grass, dreaded, feared. The idea that to think, now he continues, that the sun rose in the east, that men and women were flexible, real, alive, notice your threes, that everything was alive. To think that you and I did not see, feel, think, nor bear our part. This, word, this use of bear is part of his theodicy, as we've said, that don't ask why did this happen to me, but rather for me. To think that we are now, here, you'll, you'll think of O Me, O Life, of course, and bear our part, right, that the powerful play goes on and we may contribute a, a part. Passage two, not a day passes, not a minute or second, without an accruement, a uh, birth. Not a day passes, not a minute or second, without a corpse. Again, antipodes, these 
powerful opposites that will build so much of Whitman's view of, of life. The dull nights go over, and the dull dates, uh, dull days also. The soreness of lying so much in bed goes over. Now he's going he's gonna to get to something that, when he wrote these lines, he couldn't have known about so well, but 20 years, 30 years later, obviously, he knew very well, as we've said, 1873, a rough year for Whitman, and the soreness of lying so much in bed goes over. The physician, after long putting off, gives the silent and terrible look for an answer. Is that an amazing word picture or what? The children come harried and weeping. The brothers and sisters are sent for. Medicines stand unused on the shelf. We've seen this in drug taps. The camphor smell has long pervaded the rooms. The faithful hand of the living does not desert the hand of the dying. The twitching lips, it's amazing imagery. The twitching lips press lightly on the forehead of the dying. The breath ceases and the pulse of the heart ceases. The corpse stretches on the bed and the living look upon it. It is palpable as the living are palpable. The living look upon the corpse with their eyesight, but without eyesight lingers a different living and looks curiously on the corpse. I think there's a lot of reasons why you guys as young people should be reading Leaves of Grass, and this is one of them. To be reminded that you are amazingly young and strong and beautiful, but not for long. Not for long. This is coming. A set of lines like this reminds us, you live long enough. And this is where it comes to. And because that's the case, I mean, we know this from our study of Dick and Scrooge's story, The Christmas Carol, right? Because that's the case, and because we know it's coming, the question isn't, is it coming? The question is, how do we deal with it when it finally arrives? And that's going to be the subject of, of course, this thought experiment, which is what this poem really is. The third passage, to think the thought of death, merged in the thought of materials. In other words, we return back to the dust, to think of all these wonders of city and country. We've commented on how he always parallels those and others taking great interest in them and we taking no interest in them. To think how eager we are in building our houses, to think others shall be just as eager and we quite indifferent. In other words, once we're, well, the, the house that you're living in, someday somebody else will live in. Unless, of course, it's destroyed. The reality is all of life continues to go on. It's cyclical, right? And then in parenthetics, I see one building the house that serves him a few years or 70 or 80 years at most. Think about that notion of the 70 or 80 year lifespan. Psalm 90 in the Bible, Deuteronomy 34, 7. Of course, Ecclesiastes comes to mind with a set of lines like this. I see one building the house that serves him longer than that, in, in parenthetics. Slow moving and black lines creep over the whole earth. We're going to get back to these black lines in passage 8. The use of the word creep happens once only in all these of grass, and it's right here. They never cease. They are the burial lines. In other words, uh, pe people are uh, constantly being put back into the ground because they die. And the way he says it is, he that was president was buried, and he that is now president shall surely be buried. Obviously, we think of lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed here. And then, it's almost like the first three sections are all kind of theoretical. And then he turns in the fourth section to this amazing word picture of a cabbie, a cab driver, who will have died, will have passed. Now, Whitman was very close with Fred Vaughn, a cab driver, and it's possible that some of that relationship is buried here. Um, no pun intended. Whitman spent a lot of time with guys who drove cabs around New York City. He was impressed by their skill, their art. He was impressed by who they were as working men. There will be some uh, echoes here of, our, of, of Karl Marx as well and his celebration of the worker. A reminiscence of the vulgar fate, we're going to get back to vulgar in passage 5, a frequent sample, by the way the word vulgar here doesn't mean dirty, it just means of the normal, of the, uh, of the average vulgar, a frequent sample of the life and death of workmen, each after his kind. Think about Genesis 1 and how that each after his kind gets used. Cold dash of waves at the ferry wharf, Posh and ice in the river. Our Nortons will tell us about this word posh, which, by the way, only gets used one time and leaves a grass in its ear. Imitative of sound made by walking through slush. Whitman's use of this word in this line is cited in Webster's unabridged dictionary. Hurrah. Posh and ice in the river, half-frozen mud in the streets, a gray, discouraged sky overhead, the short last daylight of December, a hearse and stages, the funeral of an old Broadway Stage driver, stage driver used only one time in Leaves of Grass, and it's right here. And our Nortons will tell us that probably Whitman, who made friends of stage drivers, had attended the funeral of one. And then he even comments on it on Omnibus Johnson drivers in Specimen Days, his his prose his prose work. The cortege, mostly drivers, that is to say, the community. And now I want you to pay attention to the brilliant wordplay here. 
as I've said to you guys, I think Whitman's having great fun in, the, in, in writing these poems. Notice the rhythm. It's almost, can I say, clippity-clop of, of ponies, and you'll understand what I mean by that. Take a look. Steady the trot to the cemetery, duly rattles the death bell. We think of John Donne's Meditation 17, right? Do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. The gate is passed, the new dug grave is halted, at the lighting a light, the hearse uncloses, the coffin is passed out. See these little clipped little phrases? Lowered and settled, the whip is laid on the coffin. Norton's will tell us that this thing about the whip, the driver's whip, according to custom, apparently was buried with him. And then as we get out into lines 49 to 51, these lines uh, are interesting in their employment of terms of the driver's trade, which now belong to the past. There's some things being mentioned here. We just don't understand everything. The whip is laid on the coffin. The earth is swiftly shoveled in. The mound above is flattened with the spades. And then the dash. Silence. It makes us think of Hamlet's. The rest is silence. A minute. Again, a dash. No one moves or speaks. It's done. Later, it will be no interest in them. It's done. He is decently put away. And then again, the dash. Is there anything more? And I think that a whole lot of, ha of Hamlet 5, we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net, I think a whole lot of Hamlet 5 is right here in this graveyard scene to come back to it. Now we're going to comment on him. He was a good fellow, free mouth, quick tempered, think of child went forth, not bad looking, ready with life or death for a friend, fond of women, gambled, ate hearty, drank hearty, had known what it was to be flesh, grew low spirited toward the last, sickened was helped by a contribution, think about charity, died aged 41, halfway to 80, right? That was mentioned earlier. And that was his funeral. Thumb extended, finger uplifted, apron, cape, gloves, strap, wet, weathered clothes, whip carefully chosen, boss, spotter, starter, holster, somebody loafing on you, you loafing on somebody, headway, man before and man behind, Good day's work, bad day's work, pet stock, mean stock, first out, last out, turning in at night. To think that these are so much and so nigh to other drivers and he there takes no interest in them. That is to say, it is done. Notice the cycle of the days. This, uh, this will be, of course, what T.S. Eliot will play with in Proofrock, Works in Days of Hand, obviously going all the way back to Hesiod, Passage 5. The markets, the government. Now, now we're going to go from a singular, and he's done this so many times in Leaves of Grass, right? We go from the singular, the particular, to now the universal. And now we're going to kind of almost telescope out to say, you know what? What he's just described is what happens for all of us, sooner or later, right? Because you ain't met no 200-year-old people, as we've often said in our study of, for example, the Christmas Carol and the Scrooge story. Sooner or later, we got to come to that recognition. And a poem like this will remind all of us that's where we're headed. And yet, notice, this isn't going to be dreadful for, for Whitman, borrowing heavily, of course, from Song of Myself, Passage 6. The markets, the government, the working men's wages, to, to go back to, again, working men, to think what account they are through our nights and days. Song of Myself 40 will use this nights and days phrase. To think that other working men will make just as great account of them, yet we make little or no account. It's interesting what he means by this, we make little or no account. You, I'll leave it to you. The vulgar, we're back to that word in the refined. What you call sin and what you call goodness, to think how wide a difference. Go back to uh, Song of Myself 32 when he talks about animals. He's going to celebrate them later, that they don't weep for their sins. To think the difference will still continue to others, yet we lie beyond the difference. Again, this idea of, tr of trans being beyond, it's, it's uh, to, to borrow from our earlier comments. To think how much pleasure there is in other words, he's going to try and show us both sides of life. Do you enjoy yourself in the city? No, we got eight of these questions. Do you enjoy yourself in the city or engaged in business or planning a nomination and election or with your wife and family or with your mother and sisters or in womanly housework or the beautiful maternal cares? We've seen the celebration of, of the maternal. These also flow onward to others. You and I flow onward. Some have said the reason why you have to think of autumn rivulets as the cluster as ending here is this, this language, right? The river, the flow. But in due time, you and I shall take less interest in them. In other words, sooner or later, the things that matter most to us, yeah, we've got we've to leave. As we have said, you only get to swing at the park a very brief time, and they were teaching it to you from the very beginning. 
I don't want to go to the van. No, honey, you can't stay and swing at the park forever. You got to go to the van. I don't want to go to the van. No, no, the van's always waiting. Sooner or later, everybody goes to the van. You ain't met no 200-year-old people. To that degree, Whitman is reminding us, because you only get a brief period of time at the park to swing. Swing well. Swing well. Your farm, profits, crops. To think how engrossed you are to think there will still be farms. I told you about his use of the word still. Profits, crops, yet for you, of what avail? You'll remember in Song of Myself, number three, to, um, to elaborate is no avail, this use of that word. And then in passage six, he'll, he'll begin to sound almost like Mother Julian, right, of Norwich. What will be, will be well, for what is, is well. Note the interesting syntax here. And this takes us to, um, I, I have said to you many times that I think T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets is built in poems such as this. Go back to those last lines, of course, of Four Quartets, especially in that, in that very end of, uh, of Little Gidding. To take interest is well, and not to take interest shall be well. The domestic joys, the daily housework or business, the building of houses are not phantasms. They have weight, form, location. Now we're starting to sound a lot like Plato, right? That is to say that two-box theory of Republic Six that we commented on. That is to say everything that we see, it's real. It's not just a phantasm. It's real. We're just saying that it's, it's somehow lesser than. There's something more important. We're not saying that it doesn't exist in the, in, in the real world. We're just saying that in some fundamental way, it's, it's not as real as, right? Farms, profit, crops, markets wages, government, are none of them phantasms. The difference between sin and goodness is no delusion. The earth is not an echo. Man and his life and all the things of his life are well considered. And now you'll get six of these U's. You are not thrown to the winds. You gather certainly and safely around yourself. And then he says it, yourself, 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 forever and ever. Three. Three of these right at the end. Now, what is he doing here? Well, I think he's trying to remind us that there's this interesting, strange thing about our lives. We are particular, but we're also universal, yes. We are ourselves, but we're also all of us together. And yet in the end, your life is valuable. It's, it's precious. And he wants to remind you of that. Passage 7. It's not to diffuse you that you were born of your mother and father. It is to identify you. You'll remember this word diffuse when I read the book. It is not that you should be undecided, but that you should be decided. In other words, you've got to believe in something, he's going to argue. Something long preparing and formless is arrived and formed in you. Obviously, he's going to argue that is the soul. You are henceforth secure, safe, right? Whatever comes or goes. This is, again, the, 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 um, the, that's why the Song of Myself Passage 6 is so precious in a reading like this, because it's all the echoes of Song of Myself 6. The threads that were spun, think about the power. Remember when we did the Odyssey, we gave full lectures at LearnStrong.net. Remember we said that the central motif of the Odyssey, or certainly one of them, is the idea of weaving. And here we're going to get the weft and the warp here in a moment, right? The threads that were spun are gathered. The weft crosses the warp. Um, um, uh, it, from Starry Night will we'll come to a poem, uh, Weave in My Hearty Life, and, and we're going to come back to it one more time with this idea. The pattern is systematic. Systematic is used once and only once in all leaves of the grass, and it's right here. But I think this is central. This is the key line of this poem. The pattern is systematic. And this idea of the pattern of life is so central to our appreciating the value, the preciousness of life. The preparations have every one been justified. Of course, we think of our Plato, we think of our Milton with the use of that word. The orchestra have sufficiently tuned their instruments. The baton has given the signal. Proud music of the storm comes to mind. The guest that was coming, he waited long. He is now housed. He is one of those who are beautiful and happy. He is one of those that to look upon and be with is enough. The idea of contentment. Now we're going to get interesting a, a, a construction of sex. Anaphoric, the law, and then the question, uh, and then the word eluded uh, will be played with six times. Watch this. The law of the past cannot be eluded. The law of the present and future cannot be eluded. The law of the living cannot be eluded. It is eternal. The law of promotion and transformation, I told you, cannot be eluded. The law of heroes and good doers cannot be eluded. The law of drunkards, informers, again, this this antipodes, these, these opposites that always have to come together. The law of drunkards, informers, mean persons, not one iota thereof can be eluded. By the way, this word iota, you'll remember in Song of the Rolling Earth 4, not an iota less. 
Um, what, well, what's his point? In other words, it's all about the systematic patterns. Though th this is what your life is. Your life is this pattern, these patterns. And it's, it's just the way it is, guys. You can fight, you can rail against it, or you can accept it. And in the process of accepting it, you can see the preciousness of the life that is yours. Now, to finish with passage 8 and 9, he's going to culminate, and it's going to be pretty powerful stuff. Slow moving in black lines go ceaselessly over the earth. Obviously, death is universal. Northerner goes carried, and Southerner goes carried, and they on the Atlantic side, and they on the Pacific, and they between, and all through the Mississippi country, and all over the earth. The great masters in cosmos, remember Song of Myself 24 with that word, as well as they go. The heroes and good doers are well. The known leaders and inventors and the rich owners and pious and distinguished may be well. But there is more account than that. There is strict account of all. In other words, harmony, balance, equilibrium. The interminable hordes of the ignorant and wicked are not nothing. The barbarians of Africa and Asia are not nothing. Some have seen this as a racist line. Some have seen this as an amazing, amazingly inclusivist line. I'll let you decide how you want to read it. The perpetual successions of shallow people are not nothing as they go. You'll remember this word shallow from Song of the Open Road 6, right? Shallow, sly, cowardly. And you'll remember this they go, they go, I know not how from Song of Myself, uh, our, our Song of the Open Road 13. So he's channeling Song of the Open Road as he finishes this. Of and in all these things, and now he's going to get four of the I have dreamed. I have dreamed that we are not to be changed so much, nor the law of us changed, I dream that heroes and good doers shall be under the present and past law, and that murderers, drunkards, liars shall be under the present and past law, for I have dreamed that the law they are under now is enough. And I've dreamed that the purpose and essence of